Welcome to the School of Public Health. My name is Asha George and it's my pleasure to open this evening. Um, we have a star-studded afternoon, so um, I'm delighted all of you are here. I hold the research chair funded by the NRF, the South African research chair in health systems, complexity, and social change. And I think it's our delight to have Professor Tony Costello speak because many of the themes that the chair focuses on are central to what has been his work and his contributions to public health. So the research chair, some of the key themes it focuses on are when we talk about health systems, really looking at the people in health systems, the heart of health systems that make health systems complicated sometimes, but also that mobilize social change within health systems. And so there's a central theme of looking at power relations in health systems, um, some of the work on gender and human rights. And I'm looking around the room, there's Daphine. If you could stand up, she's a postdoc looking at human rights elements in health systems. There's Tanya, I don't know if she's there in the back there looking at gender analysis in health systems. Um, so we support a number of variety of uh, activities here. Another key theme is community health systems, and that's again a core part of Professor Costello's work. And we are supporting a review of the ASHA program. That's the Community Health Worker Program in India. Um, it's the, one of the leading community health worker programs in India working with the government there in looking at the evidence base um, of that program. And another key thing is frontline health workers and their lived experiences. And Leanne is sitting here right in front of me. We've been doing some very innovative work um, using social different types of media. And several of you will have seen the film she did um, looking at emer emergency medical services <coughs> here in South Africa the perspectives of people on the ground and how they negotiate health systems. So we're delighted here to host the David Saunders lecture. Um, David will do a more formal presentation. I just wanted to say one thing before I welcome Professor Tyrone Pretorius to do a more formal welcome. Um, I think Tony's work really touches on many things that, that is covered by the research chair. I met Tony several years ago in the context of a very dry WHO meeting where we were reviewing evidence for community-based initiatives. And this was before he joined WHO. And he was one of the key experts who came to present. And we had already spent a day looking at tables of numbers, very dry discussions about study design, effect size, and numerous other things. And David, was, um, Tony was invited to present. And his presentation was one image after another. And I don't want to st stage him up, but it was so powerful in terms of speaking to this audience of people looking at evidence in a very dry clinical way. He really brought people back. Why does this evidence matter? And he was the one who really taught me that doing RCTs, I'm a qualitative person, but how doing randomized controlled trials can be a political act, and how it foregrounds and positions evidence on very complex and messy processes. And he's going to be speaking on that. So I'm delighted he could be here. I want to welcome Professor Tyrone Pretorius. He'll give the context of um, why UWC is such a critical place in working on these topics that David Saunders has dedicated his lifetime to, but also other leading actors in, pub, uh, in public health. And so thank you very much, Professor um, Karen Pretorius. Professor David Saunders, Dr. Anthony Costello, uh, Prof. 
Professor Asher George and all of our other uh, Sarge Chairs present, uh, Prof. Uh, Uta Lehmann, Director of the School of Public Health, all other guests, visitors to the campus, my colleagues, students, good evening. I met Professor Dr. Costello a few minutes ago, and he couldn't stop enthusing about this university, the campus, and the extraordinary facilities. And I do have to say to him uh, that as a university, Dr. Costello, we are a metaphor uh, for what we believe this country can achieve. As a university, we strongly believe and we have demonstrated through our achievements that your humble origins do not have to define your future. I get asked to speak at many, many events. Uh, I think it's part of my KPAs. <laughs> and I try and explain to my daughters the job that I have and they just can't wrap their head around the fact that I do so many speeches because that's what they see me in the evenings doing, going through my events for the next day and preparing a speech for each of them. But there are some events that are just more special than others. This is one of them, and it's solely because of Professor Saunders, whose life's work stands as an example to all of us who work in academia. I was never aware of this day, but uh, Professor Johan Maton, uh, who works on bibliometrics and often uh, analyzes research outputs from different universities, just recently shared with us uh, an analysis of work between 2006 and 2016, and the three top researchers we expected it to be Immanuel Iwua, who is uh, one of our leading uh, um, chemists uh, in the country. Uh, but lo and behold, it was David Saunders. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Saunders embodies, I'll send you that link, David. <laughs> 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 Professor Saunders embodies the dynamic interaction between knowledge and activism, between moral and intellectual integrity, and quite frankly, putting your money where your mouth is. I have been fortunate in being the Dean of Community and Health Sciences at the time when we started the the program in public health, and I'll speak about that in a minute. And I must say, uh, uh, David and myself have crossed swords on many, many, many occasions. Um, I'm not a shrinking violet, and neither is he. <laughs> so you can imagine those uh, uh, encounters. When he received the honorary degree of Doctor of Science in Medicine, from the university at the foot of the mountain. We don't call it anything else except the university <laughs> at the foot of the mountain. Oh, by the way, we are also now at the foot of the mountain because on Friday, one of our previous uh, sociology professors, you might remember him, Professor Kwesi Pra, donated a very impressive building right opposite the Baxter Theatre to UWC. So the UWC logo will also be flying. <laughs> <laughs> but when, when Professor Saunders received uh, the honorary degree from the university at the foot of the mountain, the citation spoke of the qualities of Professor Saunders. I quote from the citation at the time, Professor Saunders is a truth teller, forcing us to confront difficult questions. He is resolute that medical solutions to illness are not solutions if people lack the power to determine their own destinies. He is radical, he is outspoken, and he is tenacious. These qualities are necessary 
not only in a South African context, where equality for all is still a green deferred, but also globally, where the wealthy and the powerful set the agenda of and the de definition of equality, access, and care. As the world pauses next Wednesday to celebrate the magnificent and the exemplary life of Nelson Mandela, it must also be used as a time to reflect on where things went wrong in our country. I spoke at the public health graduation on Friday, and uh, I reminisced a little bit about the founding of the School of Public Health, because I still believe that in addition to all these other legacies, the establishment of the School of Public Health represents our former rector, Professor Jake Scherbel's greatest legacies. Professor Scherbel, at the time, it was the early 90s, uh, decided that it was time to expand the program offerings at UWC. For many years, UWC had a limited program mix, um, obviously uh, through the interference of the previous uh, Minister of Education, we simply did not get permission to offer anything new for decades. And so in the early 90s, when the opportunity presented itself to bring in new programs, Professor Harbo, I remember in Senate Executive, was adamant that it needs to be something in public health. It needed to be in an area that resonates with the mission of this university. And uh, as these things happen, um, you know, rectors dream and the foot soldiers implement. So it was handed to myself as Dean of Community and Health Sciences uh, to implement this vision. At the time, he appointed uh, Ibrahim Rasul who later became the Premier of the, of the Western Cape, but he appointed Ibrahim Rasul to be the key advisor on what we called at the time Project Public Health. From planning to searching for the first director of the program to appointing the first director, it was really quite an exciting time in the history of UWC. I don't think Jake's in any way imagined that public health would look like it looks today. From two officers, I think it was two days, the two officers in the old sign, old arts building, to the prefabs behind the administration, to this this wonderful building, I think Jake's today would have been astounded at what has been achieved. But it has been achieved because David Saunders took that vision and he ran with it and looked at where it is today. The School of Public Health at UWC happens to be one of the only schools of public health in the country that is not located in a medical faculty. We see that as our strength and not as our weakness. Professor Gerbo fervently believed that all South Africans should, should have access to primary health care. And he believed, even though he was a literary figure, he believed that the School of Public Health will, through policy work, through winter and summer schools, will change the landscape of public health provision in South Africa. Yet, here we are in 2018, with our government still grappling to find a way between the powerful interests of the medical aids and the private health care providers and the very real and very human needs of the powerless. The voices of civil society, best positioned 
to speak on behalf of those who can't have been largely excluded. Here again, we need organizations such as the People's Health Movement, where Professor Sanders is part of the steering committee, that are advocating for a people's <coughs> national health scheme, an NHI that puts people before profits. The topic of Prof. Costello's lecture tonight, the social edge, edge, the power of sympathy groups for health and sustainable development, will speak to those who come together around a common cause to address contemporary challenges. Ensuring universal, universal <coughs> affordable, decent health care in South Africa through the NHI is certainly one such contemporary challenge. I'd like to welcome all of you to UWC and in particular uh, Professor Costello and <coughs> wish all of you well today. Thank you, Prof. Sanders, and thank you, Prof. Sanders. Thank you so much, Professor Pretorius, for giving the context of UWC, the legacies that led to the founding of the School of Public Health, and also speaking about foregrounding the contributions of <coughs> Professor David Sanders. I'd like to now invite um, Professor Sanders to come forward to formally introduce um, our speaker this evening. Thank you very much, Asha, and thank you <clears throat> and your research program, actually, for funding this event. Um, uh, because the rector may not know that, although this is an annual event, we don't have any money for it, so I'm just hinting. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Professor Pretorius, for your very kind words somewhat exaggerated, I think, because the whole project in um, public health um, and the school was definitely not my sole doing. The staff, many of whom are still here, um, both academic and administrative, really put in huge efforts to keep our operation going long before we had any such magnificent building or such well-oiled organizations required me to be removed as director in order to get good <laughs> So I'm going to say a few words now um, about Tony Costello, whom I've known for a long time. We were two elderly guys um, reminiscing in the car on the way here, and neither of us could remember when we first met each other. Um, but we dated some time to probably the early 90s. Um, and Tony will say something about this, but I really first came to know of him when he wrote a really excellent critical piece together with the progressive economist David Woodward on structural adjustment for paper was entitled Human Face or Human Facade. I won't go into the details of that, but UNICEF had published um, a critical, not very critical, but a critical um, two-volume uh, publication called Structural Adjustment with the Human Face in the very late 1980s when it became clear that structural adjustment was having a very negative impact, especially on the poorest. And of course, our own version of structural adjustment in South Africa, GEAR, has translated itself in the same way. But I won't go into that. So Tony has always been at the cutting edge of politics and science. And I have huge admiration for him because um, some of his research, as Asha has mentioned, is really cutting edge research, actually providing robust data to support what a lot of us were going on about, or as we say here, hanging on about in South Africa and before that in Zimbabwe, a 
about the importance of community participation in health. And I think that Tony's work, together with colleagues in Nepal, for me, was really path-breaking. Because it actually provided the evidence in robust trials for the power of community participation in health. And I think you will speak about that tonight. And um, I just wish there were more people here from government um, because they do really need to know about this. Um, because there's not nearly enough resources invested in that. So Tony um, wrote about structural adjustment when very few people in health were looking at this. He's written about community involvement, as I just mentioned. And of course, he's been in very important positions as Professor of International Child Health in London, following on one of my mentors, who I think was two before you. He wasn't the one immediately before you, but he, um, he, he set up that unit, David Morley, the late David Morley. And then Tony, much later, um, went to WHO, I think for five years, of oh, three. Um, and they should have kept him longer, but um, like with me, uh, people have to retire at a certain age, but you can't keep him down. So he's extremely active, and I've had him at uh, my house, staying there for about 36 hours. And I'm going to need a long rest on the <laughs> So, Tony, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. I think what you have to say is very important. We have additional events. There's one at the MRC tomorrow, and I believe others can come there. It's at 12.30 uh, at the MRC, and we'll be focusing on this area again. And we are hoping to hook in people from Pretoria, especially some people from the National Health Department, we hope. And he's also going to be in the lion's den early tomorrow morning in the weekly clinical meeting at, uh, at UCT, speaking to the pediatricians. So thank you again very much for coming, and we look forward to hearing you. Uh, so, David, when you first meet David, I can't remember what it was, you think, he's a nasty piece of work. <laughs> Let's be honest. Because I was very scared of him, and he was quite frightening in, in lectures. But I, he was the first person to really bring home to me that health is political. And he's not a retiring father to vow being political. But then you, I thought, well, He's really interested in the causes of the causes. And then you discover he's married to Sue Forkus. So, I mean, he can't be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, I remember it was in the early 90s. And I think I'd known him for longer than that, actually. I'm sorry, I heard you speak. And he said to me, he said, Tony, the, the problem is that everyone in Africa is talking about HIV right now. And all the agencies are. No one's talking about structural adjustment. And I thought about this, and I thought, and I didn't really know anything about it. So it was him who, who actually provoked that thing. And this is what a university is about. You need some very direct 
people who appear nasty at first, but actually aren't. And he knows how to arrow in. I always know in any meeting that David's there, he will ask the difficult question. And he won't be afraid to do it, even if it's Bill Gates in the room. That's another story. <laughs> so that's what universities are about. It's not, I, actually, I do admire all the buildings here. I think it's fantastic. But that's not what a university is about. Some of the best universities are in the most horrible buildings. And David, so for me to come here and give this lecture is a really big honor. Anyway, I'm going to speed up. This is the title, as you've heard. Let me get this right. Let me try this. Yeah, that works. So, that's what I was going to talk about, but I'm going to speed up and skip, skip a few things. The power of sympathy groups, experiments on cooperative nurturing, a few of the 21st century problems that this methodology might be used. And does it participation actually empower? Because there are people in the audience that might have different views on this. Starting with David, <laughs> um, as you know, he's been interested in these three things. And I knew all about that from his work, his, his books on uh, questioning the solution with David Verner. This book, which influenced me a lot in the, in the early 90s, uh, a, a piece about the G7 and the G8 and stuff that I became familiar with. But I've learned two other things in the last 36 hours I knew nothing about. Firstly, we had a discussion about who is the greatest football player of all time. <laughs> and it was, you see, I argue with my son. He says Messi and I say Pele. And then David said to me, no, it's, it's Stanley Matthews. <laughs> and Stanley Matthews was a guy who played until he's 50. I think he used to come to South Africa and do stuff in the townships. But he could dribble better than anybody else that I knew. And then he showed me Annie's autograph, which is probably worth a few bob would sell that. <laughs> um, and then he said, I'm a fisherman. I said, really? I don't know much about fishing. And I said, where did you go? He said, all over the world. In Britain, I used to fish with someone very famous. And I said, who, who the hell's that? And he said, George Mellon. <laughs> now, you won't know this, but George Mellon was one of the most famous jazz singers and writers in Britain. And he was notorious. He was absolutely obscene when you went to his concerts, but they were brilliant, hilarious. And he came actually to one of my university events. I remember him always saying, he said, I, I was born in the 30s. I began my life at the breast. I moved on to the bottle. I've been on the bottle ever since with occasional sorties back to the breast. <laughs> and David's his best mate. And they go to fishing together. So uh, completely transformed my view. Now, if we're talking about politics and social science, we're talking about power. In the same way, if you're talking about physics, it will be about energy. And power is everywhere. It's in all our relationships, as we know, and I'm so delighted that you've got equally stroppy people like Asha George and uh, Tanya Doherty here who will ask difficult questions, and I know you focus a lot on gender. It's in our relationships. You don't need to go further than WHO to know that relationships between doctors, midwives, nurses, and other members of the health community are hierarchical. Uh, the British class system, I can assure you, is alive and well, and currently in chaos, I'm pleased to see. Um, uh, the caste system in India, which uh, and in Nepal, this is actually in Nepal, which I know about. And this is a meeting in a very important place to discuss reproductive rights. <laughs> uh, it's called the White House. Uh, so power is everywhere, and politics is everywhere, and David taught me. And I, would, I have been in a position of power for the last three years. I'm not anymore, uh, relatively. And I joined WHO, and I met, on the first day I walked in, I met Andrew Cassels, who's this guy here in the cafe. he just retired, he was leaving. He came up to me, he said, Tony, do you know how many people work at WHO? And I said, no. And he said, about half. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, it's a bit like UCL, really, the university, you know, and it must be, but actually it wasn't true. I mean, there may be parts that I don't know about, but certainly in my department, everyone was working their butts off uh, to try and keep things going in an institution which is grotesquely underfunded, in my view, but that will come on to that. I'm, actually, I'm not, I'm going to talk about, very quickly, WHO, 
it was fascinating to be there because it is a political organization. It's the only really democratic part of the UN, as well as being a technical organization. And I was thinking of writing afterwards, and I still am, about what to say. And then I looked up and discovered that actually David had contributed to an article, actually a commentary on another article, that was trying to outsource everything that WHO did to Seattle and Gates and everywhere else. And he said the weakness is not technical, it's due to the lack of accountability, because increasingly people, what was it you said, commentators who present WHO as merely a technical agency, fail to consider the wider political economy are adding their support to commercial and political interests determined to prevent WHO from doing its job. Now, the new DG is an interesting person, Tedros. He made a slight mistake early on by <laughs> appointing a certain person to be his ambassador, which he calls to program worldwide. So I go around regularly now saying I'm the WHO ambassador. Um, but the thing about WHO is it has soft power. I loved all these meetings where several people here, Tanya, Mark, Thomas, there, lots of people have been there to share. This was actually the early childhood development meeting where South Africa was playing a leading role. This is where Japan were talking about home-based records. This was a human rights meeting. And I do believe in the power of getting people together to talk about jaw jaw is better than war war. And we live in a world where we need these global discussions. And then two weeks after I started, the reports came in about Zika virus. And I hadn't heard of it, to be honest, and so I mucked it up, you know. This is Vanessa van der Linden, who uh, was a pediatric neurologist, and she normally saw one case of microcephaly a month, and eight cases came in in one day. And she rang up some friends and asked, put two and two together, and she spotted the association. So she discovered it and did some brilliant work. But the interesting thing about it over the next few months was to discover the power relations of this. Because CDC from Atlanta, Center for Disease Control, moved in very fast and started extracting data, and the Brazilians threw them out. And then the Brazilians, who did actually a very good job in many ways in coordinating things, then had a lot of internal disputes about data. And then we couldn't get access to Brazil because Paho didn't want us to be there. <clears throat> because PAHO, the Pan-American Health Organization, think it's their turf. So th there are turf wars everywhere, not just in academia. <coughs> and there's lots in academia, I can assure you. So then I discovered, talking about, this is a big problem, ending childhood obesity, as indeed is um, uh, breast milk substitutes and the like. And we know that legislation and taxation and things like that are evidence-based and that in introducing sugar taxes will be one component of a, a comprehensive child obesity. Uh, um, so last year there was a, a resolution that went to the World Health Assembly and it was here and I was attending, sitting at the back because I was going to have to feed back to the World Health Assembly what was being <coughs> said and they adjourned. They said we uh, there's been some objections to the child obesity strategy, we need to go into another room and sort it out. So we went into another room uh, and they spent four hours looking at the resolution, which was not very long, <laughs> on childhood obesity. And a certain delegation, which will remain nameless, <laughs> I think you can read, objected to virtually everything in it. And at the end, there was no agreement. They would not endorse it. They would welcome it. And they were the only country in the world, rather like with the, well, actually with the breastfeeding one, uh, it was also opposed by the European Union and New Zealand, anywhere with dairy interests. So it was, it was capitalism and politics, red in tooth and claw, right in front of me. And it was very interesting. So I had to go up. They then called upon me. I was sitting to the side, you know, not a system. And they said, oh, the director general has just moved on. Uh, invited me up. So I've got this iconic photo that I showed to my children <laughs> where I'm sitting there talking. So I did a summary of the whole meeting and at the end uh, an American came up to me because I portrayed it in a certain way <laughs> and an American came up and said, Dr. Costal, uh, I didn't really appreciate that. I found, I found your tone rather patronizing. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, it's pronounced patronizing. <laughs> <laughs> and it means speaking down. <laughs> actually, that's not 
true. Right? <laughs> it's, 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 uh, but yesterday, in case you were worried, you may have seen this in the New York Times, that they yet again this year, every year now you get this conflict, and it's an important point here, because all of the big pandemics we now see are to do with big alcohol, big sugar, big food, big tobacco, big fossil fuels, big everything. And that's the challenge for public health. And that's why places like this that are unafraid are so important. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of this because I want to get onto the subject, except to say that, you know, Tedros bottom left, the so upper left is Henrietta Ford, the new head of UNICEF, which is always run by America, is an American fiefdom. The World Bank, which is another American fiefdom run by Jim Kim, who's an American, when they had the opportunity to elect a woman with a PhD in economics from MIT, called Ngozi, Minister of Health in Nigeria. They chose an American, right. And then <laughs> the head of the Global Fund is a former CEO of uh, Standard Chartered Bank, um, fined a billion dollars for uh, infringing rules in currency markets and money laundering. Uh, and I've written a piece about that, I won't go into that. And Tedros was elected by 194 countries. So being in a political democracy was quite important. And I think more and more that I spent there, the WHO has many problems. But it is a voice for everyone equally. And I think that's very important. The problem is that if you look at external finance into developing countries, the pattern has changed over the last 30 years. And you see now that more and more uh, there is private debt and equity and uh, remittances, much more than ODA. ODA is the broken line at the bottom. And so you can see that overseas development aid is less and less important. So what's happening to all these people is that they're getting into bed with some very strange bedfellows. And I think, uh, obviously, uh, when the Global Fund guys announced almost on his first week that he was going to do a big deal with Heineken, the world went ballistic, <laughs> quite rightly. Um, but more worrying to me was the links with Lombard ODA, a Swiss private bank that has been implicated with Standard Chartered in the courts right now of laundering about $700 million of blood blood. So, and I won't go into that because I wrote a little piece about this on my blog, which you're very welcome to go and read. And I think the whole contamination of private equity, I'm not against the private sector, that private equity is a major issue that is we have to resist because there are a lot of uh, people from uh, big finance who want to get their hands on health systems. Now, is everything getting